Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Question, is this thing, I uh, use this to advance the slide, the green button? Okay, cool. Thank you. There we go. Let's uh, get to some content. Uh, everyone that's in the room here, uh, CEO or other employee of a uh, small cap company, knows that the uh, public markets are pretty inhospitable to uh, smaller cap companies. And what I want to talk about today is uh, how that inhospitability manifests itself and uh, what promising developments are there legislatively to uh, mitigate uh, some of these issues. The concept of this slide right here is that uh, many, uh, back in the old days, there was a view that if you had a, you went public, then that was your, that was your golden ticket to future success in raising capital. Uh, today, in today's environment, what many smaller cap companies are learning is that the U.S. public markets are an on-ramp to nowhere for them. And as a consequence, we have this vast ecosphere numbers of OTC markets companies that are really dying on the vine because of lack of capital. And as a consequence, they're not creating the GDP that we need in order to uh, create, the, uh, continue to be the world's largest economy and they're not creating jobs, and they're not producing new goods and services that otherwise could be produced if these OTC markets companies or smaller NASDAQ companies had access to capital. Why is, it, why is this happening? In short, the reason why this is happening is because there are fewer investment banks for uh, smaller cap IPOs. You can look at uh, these, these metrics are uh, outdated because this type of information is not uh, published regularly. However, you can look at the number of comp the numbers investment banks in 94 in the red and the number in 2012. And you can see then that the number of investment banks that went out of business uh, during that time period. And the next slide, we're going to show you what the consequence of that is. And in addition, the number of broker-dealers uh, has, has decreased over time. Now, what the, why did all these investment banks go out of business? Why did they go away? Why did the brokers go away? In short, because there was no money to be made because the trading spreads collapsed with decimalization and other initiatives and sales commissions collapsed. And then without uh, sales commissions, then the former in, in trading spreads, the former sponsorship model back in the quote old days where you had these smaller regional broker deal, uh, regional investment banks would really mentor and incubate these smaller companies. They would uh, nurture them, they'd do a private placement, they'd do their IPO, they would do aftermarket trading, they would have research and they had retail brokers on the phone out there trying to get people to purchase the company stock. That entire ecosystem for the smaller cap companies has, uh, I don't mean smaller cap like the, the guys were talking before about you know, five billion in market cap, that's small cap. I'm talking about the, uh, the, the market cap of the OTC market companies who basically are represented here at this, this conference. And as a consequence then, this uh, sponsorship model went away and this creates, has created this universe of smaller cap companies that are basically orphaned as public companies. They're public companies, but they're not thriving. Uh, they're struggling just to survive as opposed to thriving and creating jobs and increasing the U.S. GDP. Now, why, why are they having difficulty? Number one is they have less investment analyst coverage. And, uh, Alan up here was talking about invest, investment analysts. That's what he does. But as a practical matter, they have less investment analyst coverage. You can see the, the metrics right here uh, based on the market cap. As the market cap um, decreases, the percentage of companies that don't have any investment analyst coverage increases. So number one, there's no investment analyst following the company. Why is that important? We'll talk about that in a minute. Number two, there are no retail salespeople out there pushing or selling the company stock. Number three, the, no, the broker dealers aren't committing capital to make a market in the, in the stock. Uh, you've got, with no investment analyst coverage, then you're not gonna attract institutional investors because they don't have any way to get any good information about the company. 
and you're going to have fewer Main Street investors coming into the company, and the capital that is often available is often toxic. Uh, there is one interesting point relating to research coverage, and that is there is academic information out there that says paid for research is almost as effective as the research you get when you work with a, an investment banking firm like Allen and his folks. They, their research coverage, they don't charge the companies for that. There are firms out there that offer paid research. You can pay them to write research reports. And the academic, uh, there's some academic literature to suggest that those research reports, even though you're paying for them, are equally as effective as a, as a research report from, say, a, a, a banking firm like Allen's company. Now, we have stock illiquidity, meaning that the number of shares traded is very, very small. And uh, many of the OTC markets companies have shares trading in the hundreds of shares per day or thousands of shares per day. You may have a, a day or here or there where there's a huge spike in the number, but if you just look at the, uh, the norm of the average trading, it's a very, very small amount of cap uh, shares traded. And this land reads the stock illiquidity. Why? Because it's, uh, they, they refer to the Roche Motel. The similar concept is the Hotel California problem. You can get in, check in, but you can never leave. And so what you'll find when you're talking to institutional investors trying to raise capital as a smaller cap company, the, uh, before, the invest, before the analyst or whoever you're talking to even listens to what your company does, they're just going to punch up the trading symbol, look at your liquidity, and based on that, they'll make a decision whether they're even going to meet with you to talk with you. And the reason for that is simply, it's, it's simply math. So let's assume for a minute that an investment fund, they're not going to invest less than a million bucks. If they can't put at least a million dollars into the deal, then it's not worth their time. Okay. They typically want to put their money to work within one calendar month, no longer. They don't have time to spend more than 20 trading days getting into the stock. Okay, now, so you take a million divided by 20 trading days, that's, they're gonna allocate $50,000 a day in trading, in, in their purchases. They do not wanna buy more than say 10% of the daily volume because they don't wanna move the price. And so if you're putting $50,000 worth of capital to work every day, then that means you got to have trading volume of at least $500,000 in order for them to be able to get in without raising the price. And so that's just the simple math as to why institutional investors are not going to invest in a company where the, there's the stock illiquidity. And you can we'll flip to the next page here then, and it shows you right here that the uh, smaller uh, the smaller the market cap. The, uh, the, the, the less institutional in, in, uh, ownership they have. And so, well, I think we all instinct, instinctively know that. In fact, the prior presen pre presentation that was talking about how do you market to companies or institutional investors, and that's because it's a huge, huge problem if you have a smaller cap company that, where the stock trading is very, very low. Now, the stock, the, the stock illiquidity then creates what uh, sort of the infamous death cycle. On the one hand, you have little to no investment analyst coverage that results in stock illiquidity, which results in little institutional ownership. And if there's little institutional ownership, then there's little to no investment analyst coverage because the investment analysts, they sell their research or that's a value they're providing. And if there's no institutional investors to talk with, then they're not going to write any research. And so we have this, this uh, death cycle here that needs to uh, be broken, and it all starts with fixing the stock illiquidity issue. You've got to start with the effective strategies for how to increase your, your liquidity in your stock, i.e., get your share volumes up, the daily trades, and uh, we had some good ideas from here earlier from the digital marketing folks, and that's where our focus needs to be. Uh, there's a footnote right here. I've written some articles at equities.com regarding the efficacy of a certain investor relations services that have are less uh, efficacious than others. And so for folks that want to Google that, Ron Westner and equities.com and those will all, all pull up. Now, the, 
the stock illiquidity has created this, uh, the following problem where companies, the OTC markets companies that could be a exchange listed company, NASDAQ, NYSC, and so forth, are unable to thrive and grow, and so therefore they are not becoming an NYSC or a NASDAQ listed company. With the consequence, then, there's this huge listing gap that's been created with the number of co public companies that we have, and I'm referring public, I mean, national market system companies we have versus what we should have. And this listing gap is approximately, we have approximately 5,000 to 8,000 fewer NMS companies in the U.S. than we really should have based upon our GDP. And if you look at this uh, index right here of the, of the growth in the number of listed companies, you can see China, Hong Kong, Australia, Japan, United Kingdom, Canada, uh, uh, or, or increasing, the UK is flat, the rest are increasing, and then we've got this decrease in, in, that we're showing here in the US, and so where the US, we pride ourselves on being like number one in the world, well, we are number one in the world in this category, we're the number one number world as to having lost uh, publicly listed companies over, uh, over this particular time period. Now, what can be done about this and what is being done about this? Uh, Congress looked at, first looked at this issue, or most recently looked at this issue back in 2018 when they were uh, trying to get Jobs Act 3.0 through the Congress. And the centerpiece of that legislation has now resurfaced in the Main Street Growth Act, which was introduced by Congressman Emmer from Minnesota in December of last year. And, the, and this, the concept of this particular legislation is the notion of creating a venture exchange. And the concept of a venture exchange is that it will be a special type of exchange where the, where the companies can have more, they, they can specify, for example, what the, the spreads they want there to be for between the buy and the sell side. And the purpose is to get back to this old sponsorship model where we had investment banks and broker dealers that were nurturing these companies and creating a, f a fertile ecosystem, favorable ecosystem for them to grow and prosper. And this, uh, this uh, exchange is hoped to, to then foster a more positive ecosystem for smaller cap companies, which will then enable them to become larger cap companies one day, which will then enable them to become uh, powerhouses to increase the, company, the U.S. GDP, et cetera, and there are strategic implications of that as well. Uh, anybody that's been to China recently or looked at, looked at what's happening there, and yes, I understand they're, they're having some particular issues right now, but their GDP is increasing very, very quickly over the long term, whereas ours is not, and in part one reason why it's not is because we, don't, we have this vast number of these OTC markets companies that could be drivers for GDP, they could be drivers for job growth, they could be drivers for innovative new products, et cetera, that are not able to create that value for the U.S. because they don't have access to capital. And so in conclusion then, the, uh, one way to think of it is uh, once a, co a company becomes OTC markets or they, become, they, uh, they list on NASDAQ, the, you go ring the bell and oh, it's a lot of fanfare and you think, oh my goodness, you know, I, I made it, we made it, this is a huge success. However, uh, what in fact what they're confronted with is this inhospitability that we've talked about today. And therefore, the, the management teams need to think about it as that this is really day one of our new challenge. And our new challenge is to confront uh, these issues that we talked about in terms of you no know, stock, trading, liquidity, no institutional investors, uh, so forth and so on. And that concludes my presentation. Questions? Well, thank you all very much. I'll take that as a sign that it was all well illuminated and easily understood. Thank you.